Okay, we're close enough. We are going to call to order. Transportation Planning Policy Committee, Kern Cog, June 18th, 2020, and at 6.30. Uh, public comments. We have one email then. Okay. Roll call, please. Corolla. B. Smith. I am here. Lisinovich. Present. Leo. Here. Trump. Here. McFarland, Stephen McFarland. Is that again? Mm -hmm. Mauer? Here. Alvarado? Gilbert Alvarado? Cryer? Here. P. Smith? Present. Gilbert Reina, Virgil Reina. Here. Couch, David Couch. I'm here. Supervisor Gleason. Here. Para, Cindy Para, I'm here. Heckman. Kirstie? Here, here. Can you hear me? Here. Yep. Yes, we do. District and 9. And Mark on the phone. Sorry? Yeah, on the phone. District 9 on the phone, Mark Heckman. Okay. Thank you. Heckman, correct? Yes. Okay. Correct. H E C K M A N. Thank you. And Michael Navarro? Uh, Michael Navarro is here. Thank you. And I think Gorolla, did you show up, Gorolla? Yes, I'm present. Thank you. Okay. And Gilbert Alvarado. Okay. Show everyone but Alvarado. Thank you. <laughs> The agenda is on that uh, yellow piece of paper, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I printed mine out, but I uh, was trying to see where, where we were going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. It wasn't on what I printed out, so let's do that now. Pledge of Allegiance, please. And Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any members of the public here? Hello, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, we did have one public comment that came in over our um, our email account that was set up for public comments. And this is a uh, a public comment for Caltrans District 6, which has been forwarded to them. Um, it said, I would like them to give me an update. Um, it, I'm sorry, I should tell you who it came from. It came from John Polaris um, from Wasco. And it said, I would like for them to give me an update during the meeting concerning the guardrail at southbound on-ramp on 99 from 46. Will it be extended? Number two, stoplight modification to have a protected left turn at Griffith Avenue and 46 in Wasco. What is the process to achieve this? Uh, number three, stoplight at North Poplar Avenue and 46 in Wasco. What is the status, of, status for installation? And I don't know if you want to 
um, have Mr. Navarro address it now or during this county transfer report? We will wait for the county transfer report. Thank you. A cookie would help. Any other public comments? None. Uh, consent agenda opportunity for public comment. Does anybody want to make any comments on the consent agenda, or do any members of the board wish to pull an item from the consent agenda? Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, did we want to have uh, Brian give his report before we move on to the consent agenda? Okay. I think I'm rusty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, at the end of public comments, we will we will now have uh, Brian Godby of Godby Research will present the results of the 2020 Community Survey that will be formally presented to the board next month. Brian will go over the uh, PowerPoint that is on your screen and has been emailed to you individually. Brian. Uh, Subject to the chairman's approval, you're you're up when he when he's ready for you. Yes, I'm okay. now ready. All right, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, present the survey results to you guys yet again. Uh, obviously, it's been uh, uh, for over ten years we've been doing this, so we're we're pleased to help you out. Um, let me just figure out how I'm advancing this. There we go. Uh, so uh, as you know, the Kern Cog commissioned us to do the survey uh, again, and we wanted to focus like we have in the past on the overall opinion uh, of current and future quality of life. Uh, we wanted to look at specific issues, uh, and I'll talk about those at a high level. Uh, we wanted to understand commute, uh, daily commute behavior, uh, and then there's questions about housing preferences, and of course, the full report has a wealth of uh, demographics, and there's literally thousands of pages of cross tabs. Uh, in terms of the data collection, this is uh, telephone and online. It has been for several years. Uh, the interesting thing is the online has become the mainstay of our interviewing now, although there are still some demographic segments that it's good to get cell phone and landline calls uh, as we did. Uh, the universe that we looked at and waited to was the uh, Adults 18 plus in Kern County, which is about 638,000 uh, people. Uh, we were in the field in January, uh, end of January through the beginning of February. So it's important to note this was before the shelter in place order went into effect by about a month and a half, I guess. Um, so this is not a post COVID crisis uh, report. This is all before that. Um, the average survey on the phone was 22 minutes long. Uh, the sample size of completed interviews was almost 1,400, 1,393, uh, of which 121 were cell, 249 were land line, uh, and the remainder were text from online and online, uh, and that's 1,023. And as I said, text. Uh, invitations to cell phones or whatever device they're looking at their texts on has really become the mainstay of our interviewing. But um, it still underrepresents a little bit the uh, senior population or senior segments. And so that's why doing phone calls, uh, although difficult, is still uh, important to do to get a, a complete sample. Uh, all of that leads us to a margin of error of plus or minus 6.2%. Uh, and um, that's a pretty good place to be. 2.6%? Uh, plus or minus 2.6, that's right. Thank you. Other questions about the methodology? Uh, and I uh, didn't mention, uh, but should have, that uh, there are 70 interviews that were conducted in Spanish. OK. Mr. So, Chair, I have a question. This is Amir Garola for the presenter regarding the methodology. Sure. Thank you. Yes, I noticed that on, that seventy per, or seventy interviews uh, were conducted in Spanish, and uh, that uh, just based out of the thirteen hundred adult residents polled, 
or question uh, isn't uh, necessarily uh, representative of the entire Spanish-speaking community. However, I did see noted that the data is weighted to the 2017 ACS. Um, oh, so, so does that weight weighting uh, take into consideration the the demographic issue? Uh, yeah. So that's just the people that wanted to take the survey in Spanish. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're underrepresenting the his Hispanic or Latino population. And in fact, if we jump, if it's not in this presentation, but I've got the data in front of me. Uh, it, the Hispanic population accounts for about 52% of the adults in Kern County. And so the data is weighted to that. So this is very representative of that population. Uh, if I admit for a moment, I can give you all of the breakdowns. Uh, the African-American population is about 5%. Uh, the um, Native American, included na including Native Alaskan, is 0.7%. Asian is 4.4%. Uh, Caucasian is 32.9%. Hispanic or Latino is 51.5%. Uh, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander is 0.1%. Uh, two or more races is 3.1%. And other is 0.7 and don't know is 1.7. So uh, that is representative, reflective of the adult population in Kern County. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, point that out, make sure that that was clear. Thank you. Yeah, sure, no problem. Okay. So let's move on then uh, into the key findings. And this, is, of course, is a high level summary. There's a, a much more detailed report as well, but in deference to your time, we wanted to hit the high points. <clears throat> uh, in the first question that we asked was the quality of life. And you can see that on this slide compared with a variety of other years. We don't show every year we've done. We have the last um, four, five sequentially, but then we start going uh, intermittently after that just because it won't all fit on one slide. Uh, and as you can see, when you add the green and the golden bar together, which is the satisfied, we're at about 62%. <clears throat> and that has come down from the high water mark of 2017. Uh, we've seen that throughout California. <clears throat> uh, as the economy recovered and rebounded, uh, other problems seemed to start taking over. So it was less about uh, jobs and those sorts of things, but it became about housing and uh, on a variety of different levels and traffic, uh, and that's, we've seen this drop throughout the state. The next question was the outlook for the future quality of life, and in this particular case, uh, you can see it, there's a, it's about the same as it was last year. There's 31% that are either somewhat or much better uh, versus 30% in round numbers uh, in 2019. It was a little higher in 2018 at 34, and a little higher at um, uh, in 2017 at 38, uh, but it's been about the same for the last two years. Now it'd be interesting to see where that future quality of life is post-COVID, but um, obviously again we we weren't in the field yet. <laughs> uh, the next question was an open-ended question, and it was, uh, "What do you like most about the city or town you live in?" Uh, and we've asked this over the years. Uh, there's comparison data in the full report, but uh, what people like the most, uh, if we look at the top three items, which are basically grouped together given the 3% the margin of error in round numbers, uh, and that's 3% plus or minus, so we look at about a 6% difference from a high to low. So small town atmosphere is at the top of the list. Cost of housing is second. Uh, and cost of living is third, so those are all positive things. Uh, location, sense of community, natural resources, uh, and on down the list um, and we, as we get into the teens. The features uh, that people like least about living in their city or town uh, were homelessness at the top of the list at 53%, and air quality at 47%. 0.5, 48 in round numbers. So those are two of the things that have gone up uh, as the economy has improved. Uh, and so that's part of what, probably what's driving the quality of life down. 
Uh, crime rate is at 45. Uh, that's obviously uh, related to the economy improving as well. Uh, gang violence at 40. Uh, and then we get into lower numbers, the traffic congestion and job opportunities. <clears throat> So moving on to the next set of questions, I'm gonna just read the highlights here. The next set of questions was, um, what are the, how do you rank these issues as of importance in the next 20 years? This is just an example of that, but because there's a lot, this is pretty dense, I just thought I would read it this year. Uh, and the top uh, most important issue is improving the quality of public education. Uh, preserving water supply was number two. Improving crime and prevention and gang prevention programs was number three. Improving water quality, different from supply, was number four. Uh, number five was maintaining local streets and roads. Uh, number six was creating more high paying jobs. And number seven, uh, as we saw just a minute ago, is improving air quality. So those are the things that people think are the most important. Uh, moving forward over the next 20 years. The uh, the next question was, what's your primary type of transportation for traveling uh, to work or school? Uh, and as you can see, we've got a lot of different little colors here in the bars, uh, which represent different years of 2020 being the golden color, 2019, 2018, 17, and 16. Again, there are more years of data for this, uh, but in an effort to get it all on a slide, uh, we cut some of them out. So you can see this year, drive alone is at 68%. That's a, up a little bit from last year, which was 64, which was down a little bit from the year before. Uh, and um, the, those two drive alones, in 2019, we had an autonomous car issue, which seemed to confuse people. Um, and so we took that out in 2020 uh, and it went up a little bit. So that could be part of it, but it is still definitely different than 2018 uh, and the two years before that. <clears throat> so uh, the next one is autonomous self-driving cars. So you see those separated out. Uh, and again, some people may be thinking that they have an autonomous car because it does some autonomous things uh, even though it may not be fully autonomous. Uh, work from home, don't work outside the uh, outside of the home is in the 7% range, uh, not a little bit different than last time, but not statistically significant, uh, as are the rest of these car and van pool at 7%, uh, traditional uh, or express bus, sh uh, shuttle bus services at 3% uh, and walking and then that continues on to the next page where we had electric vehicle, bike, uh, Uber and Lyft, taxis uh, and other, and those are all in the single digits or, or less. Um, the follow-up question was, what's the secondary type of transportation you use to get to work or school? And again, drive alone is at the top of the list and you can see it's at 32 this year in round numbers and was at 32 last year. So there's not really much change. Um, it was lower in the previous years, but, um, but again, this is the secondary way of getting to school or work. Uh, then we have Vanpool at 20% uh, and it was 20% the year before. Uh, Uber and Lyft uh, is in third position walking uh, a bus of one sort or another, bike, and then an autonomous uh, and self-driving car. Uh, and this is the rest of the response categories. Uh, don't work outside of the home, electric vehicle, taxi, bike, and uh, e-bike sharing, and other. Uh, the next question asks people to rate the traffic flow in their city or town. Uh, and as you can see here, we've broken it down into excellent, good, fair, poor. Uh, in 2020, 7% said it was excellent. That's down from about 11 in 2019, and uh, which was up a little bit from 2018. Uh, the good is at 28, which is down a little bit uh, from 2019 as well. 
So if you look at the green and the blue bars together, you'll see that we have the lowest level of excellent or good uh, in terms of traffic flow. Oops, my computer was flashing. Um, sorry about that. I'm not sure what that was about, internet connection. So as I was saying, if you look at the green and the blue bars together, you'll see we're at the lowest level of excellent or good uh, since 2016. Uh, and I think that, again, is one of those problems of having uh, a successful economy. Now, we all know that after the shelter in place went into effect um, throughout much of the state, that the amount of traffic went down dramatically. So this is, again, pre-COVID. The um, follow-up question was asking people their reasons for traffic flow uh, rating. And the top one was that there was uh, construction going on at 46%, then just traffic and congestion in general at 33, uh, road conditions, potholes, and need repairs uh, at 12, as was uh, need wider, newer roads. So on one hand, there's construction is the problem. And the other hand, we need to fix the roads and or put in new roads. <clears throat> uh, so it's a little bit of uh, a two-edged sword. Uh, growth population and on down in single digits, so not obviously as important. Uh, the next question was, what's the average commute time? Uh, and this is broken into a uh, variety of categories that you still see on two slides. Um, again, we've looked, we're looking at different years, uh, and it was reflected by the different colors in the bars. So in 2020, we were at 21 percent, said 10 minutes or less, and that's versus 32 percent uh, in 2019. So uh, there's a, a drop in the number of people in that lower category. The 11 to 20 minutes category is just about the same from a statistical perspective. Technically, it's 23 versus 20. The 21 to 40 minutes is, again, virtually statistically the same. It's 24 versus 24 in rounded numbers. And then uh, looking at average commute time uh, for the rest of the categories, we have 41 to 60 minutes, uh, and that's 18% versus 14. A little bit bigger gap between 2019 and 2018, but again, statistically, with a 3% plus or minus on both sides of the equation, there really isn't a difference. Uh, more than 60 minutes uh, was at 12% this year versus 9% last year. So again, not a statistical significantly different uh, result. Uh, and then the don't know category uh, at two versus two in round numbers. <clears throat> so the next question was related. It was sort of the other side of the coin. How many miles is your average commute? six to 10 miles was 21. Uh, that's up from 17. Uh, it's not a statistically significant difference, um, but it, it certainly is higher than it was uh, before, it appears. Uh, and then there's a big uh, jump in uh, the 11 to 20 mile category uh, from 14 to 21, uh, and that would be statistically significant. So perhaps uh, people have either moved into a longer commute or into a shorter commute, depending on where they may have come from. <clears throat> As we look at the next uh, year, we see that the 21 to 40 mile commutes are down, again, statistically significant from 25 to 18. So that could account for the change in the previous range uh, or distances as well. Uh, in the 40 plus category, it's 15, but it was 18 before. Again, statistically not significant. So it's the 21 uh, to 40 and the previous category, 11 to 20, that have the big change. And that could be people moving around. It could be them getting different jobs uh, in, that, um, in those two ranges. Uh, we asked people who drove alone what would they would what kind of transportation they would take if they were to consider alternate transportation. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, as has been the case in the past, 
the top response was I'd still drive alone. That's 40%. It's down from 47. So that's statistically significant, uh, but it's still fairly high. Uh, car van pool was at 10 this year uh, versus virtually the same last year. Uh, express bus service was at seven. Again, no real difference. Uh, electric vehicle, uh, if there's a workplace charging station, was at six. Uh, shuttle service was at four uh, and on down the list from there. Uh, and this is just shows you the remainder of the data uh, in a single digits with the exception of the none of the above category. They would stay in their single car and wouldn't consider anything else. So at that point, the questionnaire switched gears and first asked them about their current housing uh, and then as a follow-up question about their housing preferences. And as you can see here, uh, the current situation is 40% have a single family home with a small yard, slightly more, more at 43% have a single family home with a large yard, 3% uh, have a condominium. Uh, there aren't really statistical differences between any of those. There are but some numeric changes. Uh, and then looking at the rest of the list, uh, a building with offices uh, on or stores mixed use, uh, situation with condominiums on the upper floors, those are all below 1%. Uh, an apartment is at 12, down a little bit from uh, 14 and round numbers in 2019. And then the don't know category is in the low single digits. <clears throat> what we then did is ask people, well, what would you prefer? And this is sort of the forecast housing stock. There's also in the full report a uh, cross tabulation of the two of these uh, and that helps uh, you understand who wants to move to what, but um, I'm just looking at the overall here tonight. Uh, people with a, uh, that would want a single family home with a small yard uh, is about the same this year uh, as it was last year, 32%, definitely yes, 30, 40%, probably yes, so uh, right around 70% in that category. And that's pretty much the same as it was last year. Uh, a large, uh, our single family home with a large yard is at 58%, uh, definitely yes. And again, that's about the same as it was last year. Uh, same thing is true for the probably yes category, we're at 25 versus 27. So not much of a statistical difference there. Although that numerically the total uh, yes is down a little bit from the previous year. Those choosing a condo uh, or townhome uh, were at 13% uh, definitely yes and 30% probably yes. Again, that was virtually the same in 2019, so no change there. Uh, the mixed use building with condominiums is at eight and 20, uh, and it was eight and 20 before. I'm obviously rounding, so but it's really, uh, there's no change there in terms of their preference for that configuration. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's uh, the apartment. Uh, and this year we were at 10 and 22, as opposed to 11 and 24. So a little less preference, probably not statistically significant for a, um, an apartment. And so that's the end of the data that I have. There is an executive summary, which really just repeats what we just talked about. So unless there are specific questions um, that you want me to address, I won't get into that, uh, just not to be repetitive in deference to the board's time. So any questions? I do have uh, one. Uh Comment or suggestion? This is uh, Gorola from Marvin. Uh, again, I'm not a statistician, but going to question 12, when we're asking about people's preferences, um, their second choice uh, to the people that drove alone, um, what would be their second choice? And yet, they still quite a few, 40% this year, you know, still chose drive alone. That's right. Would we consider asking uh, a, a, a question where we do not have drive alone as not an option to see if 
how they would decide to, if that was not an option, what mode would they try? Is that worth um, exploring? Would that provide us good uh, information? Or it's just, you know, just a thought. Uh, but other than that, I think this is um, a good information. I know uh, uh, very in, in depth and detailed and informs us as a, a snap in time of where uh, the population here in our county, uh, where they're at right now. Um, and then we as elected officials and policymakers specifically uh, on this board, I uh, get to decide whether or not, um, looking at the numbers, we can decide, okay, this is where the people are, let's go follow them, or we can say this is where they are right now, this is where they should be going or where we should shift them. Right, and so um, I, I think this is good data to inform our decision making, and I appreciate all the work that you and your team uh, put into this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And, and just to, uh, I think it's a good idea about the question. What what I might do is ask it next year this same way, but then have a follow up question for just those people who who are sort of reticent to switch from drive alone, and say if you couldn't drive alone, what would you do? Because if we just were to replace it and take the drive alone out um, and not sort of force them into a secondary choice or a tertiary choice, what would happen is the don't know at the bottom of this would just skyrocket. Um, because the people who are telling us they drive alone are not going to have a choice. But I think we could, we could go another level on that. I think that'd be interesting. So thank you. Um, this is uh, Vallejo from Delano. Uh, my question on that same line would be, what if it was, the answer was drive alone because they have no choice as far as there's nobody else they can ride with wherever it is they have to go to work? Yeah, uh, and, and that could certainly be part of that follow-up question uh, to this one. We would just ask it to drive alone, and we'd be saying, you know, would you try something else? or do you have no other choice? They're not really transit dependent, obviously, which is a category. Uh, I'm not sure I've ever heard car dependent, but that's essentially what we're talking about. Okay, but that, that would kind of help to yeah. uh, determine as far as our, our transit that we offer within our city. Um, yeah. You know, if, they, if they're driving alone because they have to get to their job and there's no one else that goes out that way, um, yeah. that would be interesting. Thank you. Sure. Good job, though. Thank you. Good idea. Any other comments? Seeing and hearing none. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Thank you all again. Uh, stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Okay, now we will move on to the consent agenda and opportunity for public comment. Is there any public comment for the consent agenda? Hearing none, and we have no emails on that, I assume. Motion to approve it. Motion to approve is presented on the consent agenda. From Vallejo. Second. second. Okay. And second from Crump. Roll call vote. Garola? Yes. Bob Smith? Yes. Aye. Vallejo? Yes. Brown? Yes. Stephen McFarland? Okay, we'll come back to them. Mauer? Yes. Cryer? Yes. Philip Smith? Yes. Raina? He'll come back. David Couch? Yes. Gleason? Yes. Farah? Yes. 
Kirsty. Kirsty. Navarro. Yes. I'm sorry. I uh, okay. I didn't hear. It. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. And Percy. from Kirsty, Miss Farland, good. Thank you. Thank you. Caltrans report. Uh, Mr. Navarro, do you want me to go first? I don't have much to say. Are you there, Mike? Hello. Sure, Mark. Feel free. Um, not much to report from District 9. We're still working on our trade corridor enhancement program application for the State Route 58 truck climbing lanes. And I uh, wanted to thank Kern Cog's um, staff, Kern County staff, for helping us with some numbers, some economic issues that we had with it. So thank you. And um, one thing we did find out this week, Inyo County, which is relevant to Kern County, by the way, uh, Inyo County applied for both a build grant and an infra grant for Olancha Cartago. And I believe uh, the infra grant, it was unofficially declared that they weren't going to be getting that money. And then the build grant is still under review from the federal government. And uh, that's about it for District 9. Do you have any questions for me? All right. Michael, your turn. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, Michael Navarro, Caltrans District 6. A couple announcements to make. I uh, also want to update some projects, and then if it's okay, I'll wrap up and address the uh, WASCO questions that were presented earlier. Um, so as I announced last week, uh, last month, Sherry bender Eller is retiring. Her last day in the office is this week. They have appointed a new district director, Diana Gomez. Uh, she's a former Caltrans employee and most recently worked with the High Speed Rail Authority. Her first day will be July 13th. Uh, in the interim basis, Brian Everson, our chief deputy, will be acting district director. Uh, as far as COVID impacts, our district, we're still predominantly teleworking. Uh, we're looking at guidance to return to the office. However, we anticipate that being a roughly uh, still maintaining 75% telework for the time being. Also, um, long away, the planning grants were, were announced today. So I wanted to congratulate Kern Cog on receiving a planning grant in the amount of $256,000 for phase two of their cargo sustainability study for analyzing current area regional uh, goods movement operations. Uh, similar to District 9, we're, we're still chipping away at the TSEP grant application. I do want to thank Kern Cog. It put us in a really good position to apply for this application. Our hats off to Darren's team and Joe, especially his team, have done a tremendous amount of work to put us in a good position. So we'll be setting that draft up for our headquarters review to get some feedback, and then we'll follow up with Kern staff about any areas where we could enhance it and make it all that more competitive. As for projects, uh, State Route 46, Segment 4A, uh, all lanes and ramps are open. Uh, project is is wrapping up and we anticipate it being finally completed by the first uh, part of July. Uh, Cash Creek bridge replacement work continues in this area. I'm forming the abutments, the wing walls, the installing rebar. Um, work will continue. We anticipate this project being completed in this August. State Route 58 roadway rehab. This is a 3R project in Bakersfield from State Route 58 99 separation to Cottonwood Road. Uh, currently, right now in the westbound direction is lane closure and shoulder construction. It should be complete by end of this month. In the eastbound direction, there's lane closure and traffic split. Estimated project completion for this one is December of this year. Uh, Cottonwood East Rehab Project. This is in uh, 
uh, State Route 58 in Bakersfield from Cottonwood Road to just east of the 58184 separation. Uh, this project is complete and now in closeout, so I'll re remove that from the update for next month. Um, the, the Palm Avenue overcrossing at Bearsley Canal Bridge, that project remains suspended due to COVID-19 impacts. Uh, they, they have tentative uh, anticipate resuming uh, work on that project uh, next week, June 24th. And let's see. And lastly, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the uh, the Wasco, if that's okay. The questions were raised. So there's there's three questions, my understanding, and uh, feel free to elaborate or if you have any follow up. But these are the questions I received. So there's a question about guardrail, the southbound on ramp uh, to Stay Route 99 from Stay Route 46, and the question was, will it be extended? And I talked to our maintenance team, and at this point, the guardrail is not planned to be extended. But it's something we're going to be monitoring. We'll evaluate the need if it will need to be extended in the future. But this time, there's no current plans. As for, there's also a question about stoplight modification to have a protected left turn at Griffith Avenue and 46 in Wasco. Uh, what is the process to achieve this change? So what I'd recommend, I'm not sure if it's been brought up in the past. Um, however, what I would recommend at this point, I've talked to our traffic investigations team. I think we'll go out there and do an investigation. We'll look at safety data. I'm not sure. Um, Maybe the gentleman will raise the question, was there something specific you're looking for? Because I'm assuming at this location, the signalized intersection with protected left turn movements on the state highway, but it appears it's it's um, not protected on the side streets on Griffith. So was was that the concern on the side street movements, if you can clarify? The, the, the gentleman that made the comment is not here. We received the comment by email, uh, Michael. Understood. Okay, My, okay. Michael, Michael, well, uh, this is Gilbert Reyna from uh, uh, Council Member for the City of Wasco. Let me give you some uh, context uh, as to this conversation. On January 27th uh, of this year, uh, several members of Caltrans, uh, including uh, Chief uh, of Traffic Safety Coco, and I will not try to pronounce his last name in the uh, event that I might butcher it, and also yeah. Lorena <laughs> Mandibles, um, Chief Transportation Planning, uh, we met uh, with uh, several uh, of our uh, staff, uh, the public works director, the planning uh, director, um, and uh, we discussed uh, uh, several uh, issues that we have in Wasco. Namely, uh, there is a, a, a need for a, a pedestrian uh, activated uh, signal at uh, Pop 46 and Poplar and also at 43 and 8th Street. And also at the time we discussed uh, this, uh, particularly a unprotected left turn at Griffith Avenue. Um, mm -hmm. We uh, specifically discussed these issues and uh, uh, we, well, uh, the members of Caltrans uh, said that uh, they could install a Hawk system, which is something that I wanted uh, to be placed at least on Highway 46 at Poplar. Uh, we last year moved uh, a lot of the families uh, from uh, the old labor camp to a new facility, which is uh, north of Highway 46. So now we have a lot of the people that live in that area uh, coming across, particularly a lot of children coming across Highway 46 to go to school. And so uh, we also had this year somebody uh, was hit by a car. A, a child was hit by a car when it was crossing, or he or she was crossing Highway 46 on the skateboard. Unfortunately, nothing happened there. And so uh, the uh, agreement was that they were going to work on doing this. Uh, when I say they, the the people that were there from Caltrans, and that uh, it would take approximately one year. So we are around okay. the half year mark. And so I, I think that if you were to discuss these things with uh, Coco or uh, other uh, Lorena, maybe uh, they might be able to fill you in as to what uh, the status uh, of those projects is at this time. And then you can report uh, to us uh, once you find out if you at this time have no information. Right. So, so let me let me address both of those. So I heard you bring up a couple of things, and and let's talk about Poplar because I do I I do have information on Poplar. So, so the the request at 46 and Poplar, 
there's going to be a cap M project that's supposed to start at the end of this year, which would line up with the time frame you, you mentioned as far as a, a pavement job. And as part of that pavement job, we intend to include a, what we call rectangular rapid flashing beacon for pedestrians. So it, it's not the Hawk, but it's more the, uh, the rectangular rapid flashing beacon that are activated when the pedestrian is there to, to notify the, the, the driver that a pedestrian is crossing. So that's already supposed to be incorporated into that project at the end of this year to align with the one-year time frame you mentioned. So Michael, may I ask a question address. regarding that? Uh, would, would that cause traffic to stop, or would it just warn traffic that somebody's going to be crossing? So traffic is supposed to stop for the pedestrians when, when the rep, rectangular rapid flashing beacon is, is activated. So they, they are required to stop. Red light. But it's not a red, yeah, exactly. It's not a red light like, like, the, like the Hawk, which functions almost like a, which actually functions almost like a traffic signal per se. Um, right. Right. But they are well, proven it, very safe and it will notify the drivers and, and, and would, like we said, it would warn the drivers when a pedestrian person is crossing, so they would be required to stop. One of the things that was mentioned is that no accidents and no deaths have occurred at that intersection. And to me, that is terrible that we have to have some type of a major incident to do something that will actually safeguard the people crossing, particularly the children, everyone, but particularly the children. So uh, hopefully this uh, approach will not uh, cause somebody to be uh, hit and run over and you know, we will suffer a fatality for us to actually move with what is needed, in my opinion, to stop the traffic when somebody's crossing because, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, truck traffic as well as uh, other mm -hmm. vehicle, vehicular traffic. So in any case. Right. No, uh, I understand. Yeah, and, and the, the RF, RFBs have, have been proven to, to be quite effective. Um, like I said, n nothing physically stops a car. Not even a red light necessarily will always stop a car. But the RFB, like I said, it will notify the driver to alert them to stop. Um, I'll, I'll revisit this with Coco and make sure this has been fully, fully evaluated. That's the appropriate measure to fix this situation. Um, but to answer your question, that, that's what's scheduled at, the, at this point. I'd be happy to follow up and to get a little more information on that. As far as, let me go back to Griffin, Griffith real quick. I, I, that was one of the questions, and it, it talked about the need for modifying the signal. So, like I said, I think the question – for the person who maybe emailed in to modify the protected, they wanted a protected left turn at Griffith um, where there is no protected left turn movement coming from the side street. Uh, we'll do an investigation to see if that's really necessary. Um, I think one of the big challenges at that location from looking at it is, is you really don't have right away on the side street. It's very narrow with two lanes in, uh, or one lane in each direction without a lot of room because you need to widen to allow for a left turn pocket, which require right away and relocating the signals. But like I said, I'll have Coco's group do a, what we call a preliminary investigation for that intersection and see if that kind of improvement is justified. If so, and that's the recommendation that comes out of the investigation, then we can circle back with the city and see if there's an improvement that we can partner on or, or look forward to enhance that intersection if, if the investigation deems is needed. Very good. If that's okay. Yes. And then uh, we, the, other, the other one was uh, uh, Highway 43 at 8th Street. Uh, we have a lot of our staff uh, that crosses Highway 43. And um, it, is your uh, uh, team, uh, the team from Caltrans arrived to our meeting, they had to cross from the east side uh, of uh, Highway 43 to the west side of Highway 43. And uh, I observed a truck, and they observed it too because they were crossing the street, that never stopped. Mm -hmm. It never stopped as they were walking across. It just kept inching away, inching forward, and never stopped for them. So um, they experienced firsthand, you know, uh, what our staff experiences day in and day out when they cross Highway 46 to move to the offices that are on the west side of Highway 43. So they agreed to install some kind of a pedestrian activated signal at that uh, location as well. So that's at 43 and 8th Street, you said, for the pedestrian uh, no. signal? 43 and 8th, 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 correct. Okay. I'm sorry, I thought you said 8th, okay. but it's 8th. Uh -huh. Right, number 8, correct. No, I got that down my notes. Yeah, that I, I'm not familiar with 43 and 8th, but like, again, like I said, I'll, I'll revisit the, uh, like I said, the plans for the RFB at 46 and Poplar. I'll, I'll, I'll explore that with Coco a little more. Um, we'll do an investigation on the intersection at Poplar 
and I'll inquire about 43 and 8 to see the status of that or, or what's been proposed there. I'd be happy okay. to either reach out to you during the month or, or report back next month, whatever your preference is. Uh, if you can just uh, email me, that, that that would be great. And uh, um, also, let, let me say this, that uh, a traffic uh, study study had been done already as the children crossing Highway 46, but it was done at a time in which children were not active in school. So we need to make, be careful that we don't do this when there's actually no traffic occurring going back and forth. Okay. Right, which, which agreed. I mean, right now it'd be kind of challenging for that with the COVID, and I'm not sure what the school schedule is in, in Wasco when they're going back. But um, but yes, we would right. want to definitely take that in consider could take that in consideration. And before we go out there, I, I could reach out to you and, and and make sure we're we're out there at the right time. All right, that would be great. Thank, Thank you, you Councilman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Couch. I, I just wanted to say that I I agree with Councilmember Reyes, and I would like to be or excuse me, Reina, and I would like to be kept in the loop on that. Caltrans. Okay, so just to clarify, so, so I have, yeah, so I have names correct, Councilman Reina and uh, and Couch as well, right? Yes, correct, Thank you. Supervisor Couch. Thank you, Supervisor Couch. Supervisor Couch, Supervisor Couch, Councilman Reina, got you. And I'll, re I'll reach out and give you my contact information so you have that as well after this meeting. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Okay. That, that completes my report, unless there's any other questions of me. Uh, yes, I, I have a, a comment uh, for uh, Caltrans, uh, Mr. Chair. Sure. I just want to remind everybody uh, in between uh, to be muted. We're getting a little bit of feedback from somebody. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, I just want to say thank you to Caltrans. Uh, after the meeting, or last meeting, uh, when I mentioned that Arvin was still waiting on a corrective action plan uh, as to the, uh, the ATP issue, uh, we got the corrective action plan signed. So appreciate that now we can get to work with the county on uh, getting those projects done. Uh, again, it should not have taken over two years, especially after Caltrans uh, came out so hard on the city for essentially what was uh, an error on their part. But yet again, uh, appreciate it. Um, and uh, looking forward to uh, applying for and being successful in receiving those ATP grant funds to promote the goal of active transportation in our community. Thank you. Understood, Mayor. Thank you for that comment. And I apologize for the two-year time frame. Um, it is a little frustrating on your end and ours, of course. And um, I wish you luck and in, in success in applying for future ATP grants. Thank you. Any other comments for Caltrans? Hearing none, the executive director's report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. I have a handful of items. Uh, first item is in your folder. It's the May 31st, 2020 local assistance delivery by county report. Um, as you know, I've reported on this um, report in the past, and this is reporting on all of your cities and the county's um, delivery of federal funds o over the last fiscal year. And if you look at uh, Kern's line, we had $20.7 million allocated to us, and we delivered $23 million. And well, how do we deliver more than, uh, than we're allocated? Is we take money from other counties who don't deliver. This year we've delivered 111.6%, which is third in the state. We're, we're making progress. As a reminder, there's 58 counties in the state. Um, only five counties were over 100%. So this is congratulations to your agencies. I can be very demanding of your, your staff. Sometimes I come to you as elected officials directly to put pressure on them, but this is this is where it pays off when we get to spend other people's money. So congratulations, let's keep it up, and uh, let's see if we can get a little higher than third place next year. Uh, a few more items. Uh, California Transportation Commission is meeting next week virtually. I will attend that meeting. They uh, will, uh, I will attend that meeting virtually. They're scheduled to meet also in August. If that is a virtual meeting, I will attend it. If uh, it is in person, 
um, we may have staff there. Uh, as a reminder, the CARES Act, that was the act um, that um, many of you have already applied for, the transit funding that was part of the CARES Act. All the cities, including um, Golden Empire Trans including Golden Empire Transit, Delano, which are in a separate category than everyone else, and all of the smaller cities have applied for that funding, except to Hatchapi, Ridgecrest, and Cal City. Mr. Snotty will reach out to all three of the Eastern Kern cities and assist them if they need assistance in applying for that money. As Michael mentioned uh, briefly in his report, um, Kern Cog was notified t today that we received a $256,000 grant. Michael mentioned it's for Cargo Sustainability. That's an acronym. It stands for Kern Area Regional Goods Movement, and it is the northern metropolitan part of the metropolitan Bakersfield area. So it in involves Caltrans, Kern County, Bakersfield, and Shafter. The goal is to coordinate the uh, circula circulation elements of all those, uh, of the two cities, the county, and Caltrans. So we are all on the same page to deal with the growth that is actively coming. I read an article today that Amazon is potentially hiring 3,000 workers. So you got uh, 3, 000, potentially 3,000 people going to work every day and the hundreds, if not thousands, of trucks that are going to be generated by both Amazon and the other businesses that will come to the area. So this is great news, and we will be in the second phase of the study. We will be getting into the specifics of what projects are necessary. Will there be a new interchange necessary on 99? Will there be new connections on 65 necessary? Uh, that concludes my report on this agenda, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any questions for the director? Hearing none. This is still in Hatchby. Yes. it's still in Hatchby. And adding on to uh, Aaron's comments about the the additional trucks that uh, will have an impact on the climbing lanes schedule for 58. Thank you. Thank you. Any member statements? At this time, this meeting is adjourned and we will move to the Council of Governments meeting. Roll call is the same. Um, Any? No, it is not. No, it is not. We're going to change. Kirsty left, I believe. Yeah, you don't need to recall them. And I, I, I wanted to see if Alvarado showed up. Didn't you mention that Carmen didn't respond? Yeah. Okay. Um, Gilbert Alvarado? And Stephen McFarland? And Kersey? Okay, thank you. Do we have any public comments? No emails for this, and so nobody here. So the consent agenda, any public comment on that? Seeing none, can I have a motion? Motion. Second. Second. Roll call vote, please. Carola? Yes. Bob Smith? Yes. Nick Lisinovich? Aye. Leo? Aye. Tom? Yes. Bauer? Yes. Choir? Yes. Bill Smith? Bill aye. Smith? That was I. Raina? Thank you. Raina? Yes. Couch? Yes. And Gleason? Yes. 
Thank you. Very good. Executive. Sorry, Executive Director's report. Good evening again, Mr. Chairman and board members. Uh, just three, three quick items. On June 26th, the San Joaquin Valley Regional Policy Council and Multi-Agency Working Group will be holding a virtual meeting as a reminder that um, our representatives are Supervisor Scribner, Council Member Smith, and Council Member Proud. Uh, July 1st, as a reminder, is the deadline for local early action planning grants. Those are the housing grants that are available to all the cities. And my understanding is many of the cities in Kern County not applied for those, for those grants. Uh, please contact your planning director if you're interested in those grants. We, uh, in your folder this evening is the timeline covering June through September, the Kern County, Kern Council of Governments news and events, the schedule of cash disbursements covering April and May, the um, federal fiscal year 1920 um, obligational authority form that I went over briefly, and uh, we have two 20-year recognitions um, for you to um, uh, hand out tonight, Mr. Chairman, and that concludes my report. Uh, subject to any of your questions. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Um, the housing grant, uh, where would we get the information on the, the specific grant? Ms. Uh, Ms. Napier can uh, send that to you tonight through email. And, okay. and the information was sent to all the city managers and planning directors, but uh, she will send it out to the, the full board and all alternates tonight. Okay, appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, any other questions for the director? Any member statements? Seeing none, then we will do the two service awards. 20 years of service, thank you very much. Chica Montalvo and Michael Heimer. Thank you. So I got the right one going the right person here. Thank you very much. You. 20 years is a good amount of time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate the service. with that we are adjourned next meeting is july 16th